We're going to call the meeting to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand? Oh, everyone's muted. Unmute all. Councilmember Bertrand? Is still present. Thank you. Councilmember Botorf? Here. Councilmember Story? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Peterson? Here. Uh, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Do I, oh, do I need this or no? Because we have this microphone, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. In accordance with the current shelter in place order from Santa Cruz County Health Service and executive order in 2920 from the executive department of the state of California, this council meeting is not physically open to the public. As you can see, we have limited council members and staff physically present in the council chambers during this meeting. The rest of the council is participating remotely via video call. Members of council can use the reaction choices in Zoom to indicate they would like to speak, similar to raising a hand. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first broadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from the city's website, cityofcapitola.org. Our hardworking technician tonight is Benjamin Thompson. Thank you for being here again tonight, Benjamin. Despite being physically close to the public, participation is still possible. Public comment can be emailed to the council for their attention during tonight's meeting. Please identify the item you wish to comment on in your email subject line. Emailed comments will be accepted starting now up until I announce that public comment for that item is closed. Each emailed comment can be read aloud for up to three minutes or displayed on a screen. Emails should be sent to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Emails received at that email address outside of the comment period outlined will not be included in the record. Lastly, we want to thank you for your patience tonight as we adapt to a different way of conducting council meetings for the safety of everyone involved. Moving on, can we get a report on closed session? Uh, oh. And there is nothing to report. Oh, am I muted? You're all right. Am I getting, okay. Direction is given to staff. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any additional materials for tonight's agenda? Yes, there was one item um, regarding, there was an email regarding item 8A and another email regarding 8C. Got it, thank you. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes. Great, thank you. We're gonna move on to public comments. Uh, this is the time for the public to communicate with the city council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. So we're gonna go ahead and open up the uh, email uh, for public comments. And it looks like we've got a couple. So we're gonna go ahead and, uh, are we gonna use the screen reader? You will use the screen reader and I'm gonna share the screen council members so you can see this. Okay. So here we go, read aloud. I would like to formally ask the city council to inform the public of intentions regarding the closure of the Capitola Beach for the summer months and beyond. I have heard from many around the community that you have made the decision or are leaning towards keeping Bar Beach closed and I feel it is important to inform residents and business owners immediately of these plans. I would like to ask each council member to publicly state their position for the opening or closing of the beach for the summer season. It is my belief that the closing of the Capitola Beach for the summer months will have a grave impact to the businesses in the Capitola Village and the property rental businesses that depend on the summer revenue. Many businesses in our village will not survive if the Capitola Beach is closed as they are dependent on tourist dollars. Also, 
the loss of tax dollars derived from tourist revenue will severely constrain the city of Capitola's annual budget. I would also like to ask the city council to explain what measures have been explored, if any, to facilitate the safe opening of the Capitola Beach for the summer. For instance, have you considered limiting sunbathers to specific sectioned off areas that they are assigned on either the first come first served basis or make reservations in advance as with California state campgrounds? The beaches in Italy intend to implement systems of social distancing such as this and I see no reason why we cannot do the same. In addition, have you explored the possibility of closing the Esplanade to cars and making it the pedestrian zone in order to facilitate social distancing? Restaurants could then set up tables outside and other businesses could move product outside in a sidewalk sale which allows for patrons to maintain social distancing. Finding a viable alternative is the least the city council can do for these businesses that have suffered so greatly over the last few months. While these ideas may seem like unusual measures, we are living in unusual times and we cannot just stand by and watch our village die. I respectfully request that you inform the public about your plans for this summer and consider investigating the feasibility of some of the options I have described above. Laurie Ingram. Okay, that's the first comment, and then I believe this is the next one. Item 5 Public Comments. The CBWBIA requests the city consider, as an emergency item, a universal encroachment permit for businesses in the area covered by the CVWBI-8. We request that sidewalk display of merchandise would be permitted as long as all the social distancing requirements are followed. We are requesting permission for a business to have one table or one clothing rack and one table on the sidewalk in front of their business. The display would be monitored by the business to be sure to comply with social distancing. We appreciate your consideration. Karen Hamill Capitola Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area. And I believe so. I believe this is public comment as well. I understand the serious financial challenge facing the residents and city of Capitola. Having served the public for over three decades as a local nonprofit director, I hope the current crisis would make clear the vital nature of our collective programs. In fact, many of us were deemed essential businesses and have worked throughout this time serving school age youth, families and seniors. Most medical services, support services, food, transportation and mental health services transitioned but did not cease. We should share the pain of budget cuts but do so add equal partners. I find the recommended cuts to community programs to reflect a long discarded characterization of our services as a luxury instead of something necessary for community well-being. As a graduate of a school of public health, I did not foresee the day when a crisis of this magnitude would threaten all of us and at the same time separate each of us. I urge you to cut the community program's budget commensurate with other city departments. Isn't the only lesson we can learn is that we need each other? David P. Anki. David Bianchi, Executive Director, Family Service Agency of the Central Coast, 100 for Walnut of 8, Suite. And then this comment, this comment it appears to be one of the items on the general business. So that's the end of public comment. That's, um... Oh, okay, yeah, that was general business, okay. Um, Okay, so we're going to have that read when we get to that item, yeah. correct? Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so uh, seeing no additional public comments coming in, uh, we will close public, open public comment, or excuse me, we will close public comment now uh, and move on to city council and staff comments. Does staff have any comments? Staff has no comments at this time. All right, uh, let's move through our city council members. Uh, council member Story, do you have any comments? No comments. Thank you. Oh, did, did, was there a hand? Oh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Comments? Hi. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask staff to bring back um, a couple of items if possible. Generally, um, in our around this time is when the BIA um, is on our consent calendar. And I'd actually like to ask them to present at our next meeting 
kind of on the status of the village and kind of the, and the things that have been taking place. Um, from what I understand, Karin Hanna um, has been appointed to the economic uh, council for the for Santa Cruz County. So I'd be interested in just hearing what's been going on. Um, and from what I also understand, they've met. Um, as well as the staff to come back with some options to amend our signage and markings um, for businesses in the village in response to COVID-19. So again, everything within the state and county order, of course, um, but if there's any options there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, any comments? You're muted. Can we unmute uh, Councilmember Bertrand just to confirm if he has any comments or not? I do. Okay. So, um, yeah, I I read something on one of the letters from people uh, in the city about the um, the effect of not closing off the lagoon, and I wanted to ask Steve if he could respond to that in terms of would this endanger our ability to close it in the future if we didn't close it now? I have a couple other comments after that. Sure. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, we have checked our permits and actually talked to the two agencies we report to annually, and there is no lose it or use it clause. Um, they have indicated that we would not jeopardize our permits if we did not proceed with the closure of this. I'm summer. having trouble hearing Steve. Can we turn the mic? I'll try it without the mask. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have checked with uh, the two agencies that we report to annually concerning uh, our permits and read through the permits and there is no, we do not believe there's any jeopardy of losing the permit should we not do the closure this year. Thank you. Thank you. And my other comment or question is of our city attorney, Sam. I appreciate your um, forwarding us the, government's, uh, the governor's order and I understand that we're going to have some options in terms of developing plans with our local public health. Um, is there an update on that or maybe not available now, but I'd kind of like to have an update on that because many of the requests from people in the city are in recognition of the fact that we're pretty low in terms of uh, coronavirus um, cases and maybe our plans should be um, relax a little bit. So I kind of like to know what our public health department is doing in that regard. It may feel otherwise, so that's something I'd like to hear about. Certainly. Um, I am planning to give an update during the um, item on the agenda about COVID. Would, okay. you, uh, would you like me to do it then or? No, I think that's appropriate. Your question is timely. There was actually a comment that I wanted to respond to as well. Shall I wait until that item? Please. The city manager, but you can't tell. Does that yes. work? Okay. Yes, I'll please do that. do that. Okay, very good. Thank you. So also I was reading uh, citizens' um, emails um, yesterday and today and some of the comments that came in today that we read as part of the public record. And it's pretty clear to me that our merchants are in a rather desperate situation, many of them more so than others, because we depend on the beach. Um, a lot of our normal activities will be curtailed because of COVID and also our financial difficulties. So I'd like to propose for the next city um, meeting, and I'd actually like to propose that we would consider having an emergency session uh, to consider uh, the issues that our merchants are feeling right now that's not just our beach merchants, but we also have 41st, we also have along Bay Avenue, but it's mainly, mainly the city uh, around the Esplanade, the city merchants around the Esplanade. So I'd like to propose a city meeting, and if the city council would agree, uh, make that an emergency meeting so that we could react before Memorial Day and other days that a lot of people would visit the city. That's my comment, my request actually for an agenda item. Thank you. Do you wanna, how would you like to, he's asking for it to be an agendized item, so I'm not sure. So my recommendation would be that we get into the COVID-19 update. And we're gonna be talking about a number of these issues. And at that point, I think then we can determine if we have future agenda items that come out of it. 
Okay, at this point, my request still stands, and we'll wait for that update to see how, how it fares. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bottorf, any questions or comments? I have no comments at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, okay, I just have a, a couple comments. I just want to um, address briefly. We have received several emails about uh, the beach closure. Um, I want to share that. Let, let me start with that, the beach closure. I want to share that um, I've been on weekly calls with the mayors of Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, Watsonville, and myself in Capitola. Also on that call weekly is the uh, city managers for each of those cities, as well as the county public health officer and the sheriff. Um, at each of these meetings, we get updates um, from the county public health officer who, is the, um, uh, who has the authority um, to place our public health orders, including our beach order. So that's actually not a city council order, um, the, the beach closures. Um, but at our meeting tomorrow, I do plan on asking her what uh, the plan is for the remainder of the summer. Um, including if there's going to be any possibility for suggestions like uh, outside tables in restaurants. Right now, that uh, current with the current order, uh, that's not permitted. I will be asking her for uh, any information she has on how that will look moving forward. Um, the, there was also a public comment about uh, encroachment permit for sidewalk display of merchandise. Um, that's also something I'm going to be asking tomorrow if that's permittable under the health order. Um, and then once I get that information, I think that's something that the city council um, could consider uh, once we get that information. Um, additionally, in addressing the concerns about the uh, businesses, uh, council member Bertrand, I had a Zoom meeting with, I wanna say it was probably 25 or so um, businesses, uh, BIA members and, and village business owners uh, on Tuesday. Uh, to hear their concerns, I will be taking several of those concerns back to the uh, meeting, as I mentioned, tomorrow. Um, and also in response uh, to that meeting, we have developed a uh, mayor's business recovery task force. Um, and it's going to have about nine or ten, I would say, um, business representatives, not just from the village, but also from 41st Avenue and different uh, sectors of, of the economy here in Capitola. Um, we are our business liaison. Uh, will be helping us to uh, get that group together to come up with ideas and suggestions for how Capitola can safely reopen once we are legally allowed to do so under the public health order. Um, and I believe there'll probably be some more information about that when we get into the, the COVID update item on the agenda. But I did want to acknowledge that I'm, I'm receiving these emails, I'm hearing the concerns, we're doing our best to address them um, with the authority that we have to do so. Um, and with that, I think we will move on. So we are on consent calendar, item seven. Um, these items will all be voted on in one motion by the council, uh, unless there is any item that the member of the public or any of the council members would like to pull for separate consideration. So let's start with, um, is there any item that any uh, council member would like us to pull for separate consideration? And if so, go ahead and, and use uh, the emojis. So it looks like Vice Mayor Brooks has an item she would like to uh, consider for separate discussion. Yes, thank you. I just needed some clarity on item 7C. Um, the staff report is different from the resolution statement on how much the LEAP grant funding is, and I just wanted to seek some clarity on that. So I don't know if you want to pull it all together or just if staff is prepared to respond. Do you want to pull it or do you want us to quickly? Let's let's just quickly, yeah, okay. let's just quickly um, address that. And the staff report. Just explain a little bit what it is. <laughs> this is Katie Hurley, Community Development Director. In the staff report, it's it incorrectly states $60,000 for the grant amount for LEAP. And in the resolution, it is correct at $65,000. And that's what the application would be submitted for is the $65,000. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Were you able to hear that, Vice Mayor Brooks and council members? Yeah? OK. All right. Um, any other member of the council that would like to pull an item for separate discussion? Seeing none, uh, do we have any public comment from any members of the public who are asking to pull an item from the consent calendar? It doesn't look that way. Seeing none. 
All right, with that, we will uh, entertain, bring it back to the council and uh, entertain a motion. I so move the consent calendar. Second. Motion by Vice Mayor Brooks, second by Council Member Bertrand. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Bator. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Consent calendar uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to item 8, general government and public hearings. Uh, item 8A is an update on the city's pandemic response. Turn it over to staff. All right, let me just get us going here. I'm going to pull the mask off just to make sure that I can be heard. Um, so this is our bi-weekly update for the city on the state of the COVID-19 response, focused on what we're doing here in the city of Capitola. At our last meeting, we were talking about the new beach orders. They've been in place now. Uh, the public health officer issued those at the end of April. They've been in place for a couple of weeks now, which closes the beaches to all activity between 11 and 5, keeps the beach open uh, during other hours for non-sedentary activities, and keeps the water open at all times. On May 6, the health officer issued another rule that realigned our shelter in place order to better match up with the state rules of regarding what businesses would be open and also to allow curbside pickup for, um, for retail shops. This is our check-in on our current status uh, of the virus in the county. This is as of today, we have 149 known cases. Um, we've seen relatively steady but slow growth over the last gosh six weeks i would say four weeks um, and that's we have the 149 positive cases out of 5287 total tests so a relatively low number of positive tests quite a quite a low number of positive tests out of the total number that have been conducted uh, this shows the curve over time you can see actually in the last week or two we had a number of 24-hour periods that's in this area here where we actually didn't record any new COVID cases, which I know the public health officer was very excited to see. I know just recently here we had four uh, yes, day before yesterday and then two yesterday, but to have a couple of days go by with no cases was, was certainly uh, an important threshold. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Samantha and you can talk a little bit about sort of state activity. And then we also have that next slide on retail. So do you want it on here or the next slide? It doesn't matter. Okay. Next slide may be more helpful. Thank you. So I, I know that there have been a lot of questions in the community about what the city, about whether or not the city could move more quickly to reopen. And the answer is no. Um, the state, the governor's office issued an order on May 4th indicating that the state was moving into stage two. And then a couple days later, the governor's office issued what is called on the website a resilience roadmap. And the resilience roadmap includes guidance for different sectors of the economy to reopen. Some of those sectors are in the beginning of stage two, including retail for curbside pickup for the um, retail outlets listed on the slide, clothing, sporting goods, bookstores, forests. There are some other Retail, there are some other businesses, um, such as dine-in restaurants is one of them, that are in later stage two. And the governor's website clarifies that the state is not yet in later stage two. Um, cities, individual cities, do not have the authority to reopen faster than the state allows. Cities, the only authority that cities have currently is to implement regulations that are more restrictive than the, than the state order or the county order. We have always been able to do that. So for instance, um, if the state order said that, I don't know, that um, certain segments of retail were closed, we could close all segments of retail. I know that's not what anyone wants to do right now, but I'm just giving that as an example of the only authority that cities have is to be more restrictive than the state. The only exception is if the county 
in which the city is located, in our case, Santa Cruz County, applies for what's called a variant from the state order. And the, um, the requirements for a county to apply for a variance are listed also on the state website. And no county, no large county yet in the state has applied for a variance. Um, I've been in contact with county council in Santa Cruz, and he has indicated that Santa Cruz County has not applied for a variance. So at this point, we are being consistent with the state order. Um, even if Santa Cruz County were to apply for and receive a variance from the state order, what that would allow us to do is to go deeper into stage two. It would actually, it would allow us to move more quickly into the later phase of stage two. We cannot go into stage three with a variant. And so even if the county got a variant, that would allow cities, that would allow the county to issue an order that is less restrictive than the state order. And it would allow the cities in that county, including Capitola, to comply with the county order, but only the county can issue regulations that are less restrictive than the state and only then with a variance, which Santa Cruz County does not yet have. I hope that's helpful. As we move deeper into this, I think the rules become less cut and dry. So um, I would encourage anyone who has questions to constantly check that resilience roadmap on the governor's website, which um, is, being changed somewhat frequently. It's changed a few times in the past uh, week and a half since it's been issued. And the changes are not always easy to find. Sometimes you have to read really carefully and compare it to what was issued the day before. I think the governor is also mentioning the changes in his press conferences. Are there any questions? I know that's a lot of information. Are there any questions from council members? If so, go ahead and um, you can utilize the uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, looks like you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. Um, this question might uh, be for our city manager, yeah. for our city attorney. Um, I know it was mentioned before, but can you offer some more clarification on why why our particular city follows the Santa Cruz County order through their health officer? I think sometimes we see things on the news that a city has moved forward with some changes um, because they have their own health officer, but in our case, we don't. Um, can someone speak to that? I, I can speak to that, and that is a very good point. Um, if you'll notice, when a, a lot of the Bay Area counties often act together, there are six Bay Area counties that tend to issue orders together. And if you'll notice, there's six Bay Area counties in the city of Berkeley. And the reason is that the city of Berkeley is one of three cities in the state of California, the other two are Long Beach and Pasadena, that have their own health department. And the key to be able, being able to issue orders is to have a health department. The vast majority, every city in California, with the exception of those three, does not have its own health department, so it does not have its own health officer. Those orders are issued by a health officer. And so because Capitola does not have its own health department and does not have its own health officer, we are subject to the orders of the county health officer. One other point related to that is cities do also have the authority to go further and do other things to protect the residents. So for example, here in Capitola, we put in place, as the council is aware, <clears throat> certain orders such as we closed the upper and lower uh, Pacific Co parking lots. We implemented different times um, for parking in the village. We have also, you'll have an item on your agenda this evening once I get through this presentation to consider ratifying an order <clears throat> that would suspend certain provisions in our zoning code that um, don't allow retail pickup, things like that. So we have the ability to operate in a less restrictive fashion and control other things in a space that the health order doesn't occupy. So we do have that flexibility. And you'll hear about cities doing that, maybe cities making decisions about closing a skate park or closing certain facilities. But, but Sam is exactly correct. We don't have a health department in the city of Capitola, and so we are subject. We are. Our health department is the county health department. And can, I, can you just clarify quickly, just because you mentioned it, and I want to make sure that people understand what you just said, that we are considering uh, tonight on the agenda, correct, uh, the changes that would allow yeah. for retail pickup, not that we are 
per, not that we are prohibiting retail pickups. Right. Correct? Yeah, I'm going to get you. into that in a second here. I have a yeah. slide or two. I just on. wanted to make sure it was clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Looks like Councilwoman Brooks might have another. Oh, sorry. I've got, I can only see three people at a time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Vice Mayor Brooks, my apologies. Go ahead. Yes, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up. Um, I really appreciate these updates on the city's response. And something I just wanted to add real quick is that there are other um, entities like Community Foundation, the Small Business Center um, Development Program at Cabrillo and Santa Cruz County Bank, as well as the county's economic department. These are all agencies that are supporting our businesses. And I know we're, we're talking a lot about these emails we've received regarding businesses. And I just wanted to note um, that those organizations are out there in support. And so perhaps in the response, um, this is directed to our city um, manager, if we can maybe add a slide, if this continues on on our, uh, our agenda, about what our city's response is uh, above and beyond. So, um, and I'll just leave that at that, if that makes sense. Sure. Why don't we continue with the presentation and then we can see if there's, because I think some of these things may be covered. Sure thing. So one of the things we've really pivoted towards this last week has been local business outreach. Um, one of the things I've done is I appointed former city manager Rich Hill to be our business liaison in Capitola. Uh, Rich has been working for a volunteer organization called SCORE to serve as mentor, a mentor and help um, small businesses already in our community in the Monterey Bay region. And <clears throat> when I reached out to him, he said he would be happy to help and would, could bring all of the SCORE's resources that they already have to help small businesses with him as well. Rich is working with my staff to set up a web page on our site um, that'll really be just information for local businesses. It's gonna be kind of as, as Vice Mayor Brooks suggested, kind of a, a little bit of a directory on places to go to where to get help. Um, so it'll be, we'll try to combine everything we can for this county and resources that are available already to local businesses. And as Mayor Peterson mentioned, we've established a Mayor's Business Recovery Committee. Um, and the goal is to really improve communications with business groups and then also identify these key steps. And we heard in public comment, um, a member of the BIA suggesting potentially allowing for outdoor displays in the village. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ideas that have been floating around in terms of changing parking times, maybe to facilitate business. Um, potentially, I know some cities have talked about using streets in different ways to promote more business activity. And so our hope is, is that this business committee can come up with some recommendations then to bring to the city council. And they may or may not apply right now. They may be come, come into effect um, down the road as we move into later phases, but trying to get ahead of this. So that's one of the things we've done this week. Um, we also have the, let me just, oh, did we, I guess we didn't have a slide. So in addition, I'm sorry, I must've skipped over this. We also have on tonight's agenda is to ratify emergency order 3 2020, 2020 um, which is really was intended to increase the flexibility for curbside delivery. There were a number of provisions in our zoning code that either required a conditional use permit for spaces within a shared um, parking lot. So for example, at a mall or some other shared commercial parking lot that made it relatively difficult to designate specific parking spaces for a business or for a certain use. And the intent behind that was really because those spaces were intended to be shared by all the commercial businesses that use that lot. With the governor's order and this curbside pickup, it makes a lot of sense to have spaces that are designated for that specific purpose. And so the order that is before the council tonight to ratify would suspend um, three key provisions in the zoning code that requires that parking, um, parking spaces be shared in these shared parking lots for commercial tenants, that suspend the requirement for a conditional use permit, for restaurants to offer curbside service, um, and then also suspends a prohibition on that, uh, the curbside service in other zoning districts. So this doesn't apply, should be very clear, this doesn't apply to parking spaces in the right of way on the street. This is in private lots, and most particularly, it's most relevant in these shared lots. So that is ratifying that order is on your agenda tonight for adoption. And 
we always touch on this briefly during our update. At this point, the police department is open and our parks are open. The beach, we've talked about what the beach parking, the beach rules are. The wharf at this point has been closed for the renovations. So we could look at opening the wharf. The challenge I think is that there's, um, it's not clear under the health order whether or not fishing is allowed. And I know that the rules requiring active recreation apply to the wharf. And if fishing isn't allowed and people can't sit on the wharf, we're a little bit concerned that opening the wharf is really just an invitation for violations of the health order. Um, so we're trying to get clarification about fishing. If fishing is allowed, I think we would, we would um, open the wharf. If it's not allowed, we need to look pretty hard at whether that makes sense or it's really just asking people, creating an attractive nuisance and encouraging violations. And the other city facilities listed here are closed. So with that, my recommendation is by supermajority vote to make the determination that the hazards associated with the pandemic still exist. And then in addition to approve the resolution that's attached to your packet that rat ratifies the emergency orders that temporarily suspend the restrictions on curbside pickup and delivery. And with that, I'm available for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, council members, let's see. Um, do you have any questions? Okay, council member Story. Looks like you have your hand up. I do, thank you. Um, just Jimmy, uh, I had um, uh, first uh, concerning the curbside pickup. Are there guidelines on uh, what is permissible and what is not permissible in order to um, be able to carry out curbside pickup? Um, can merchants set up tables for curbside pickup? Um, or are there guidelines out there or are there things that we could share with the merchants uh, in advance so um, they can know what the parameters of curbside pickup are? Um, and I was also thinking of, um, you know, the, the kiosk uh, at the Esplanade, which we generally have during the summer. Um, it's an outdoor um, vendor. Does that qualify for curbside pickup? Um, and um, and um, on my uh, other question is, um, I have gotten lots of emails of people making recommendations, and this is concerning the beach closures. Um, and they're proposing um, kind of a residency-based standard, which I know is impermissible, but it, it, it'd be nice, I mean, if we could have something official from the city saying it's just not possible for police to, um, you know, enforce the rules based on where somebody lives. Um, um, so that at least, you know, the residents can be aware of, uh, of why we can't implement, um, you know, such a enforcement uh, mechanism. Um, and uh, so those are my questions. And, and and I have some other comments in a little bit. Thank you, Council Member Story. Um, should we go to our city attorney for the, for the answers? Sir? I think she's ready to answer. All right. Sure, I, I can answer some of it, and then maybe the city manager um, has something to add. Um, as far as the guidance, there's extensive guidance for every industry that is opening up on the governor's website. And so I would encourage any business that is engaging in curbside retail to go on the governor's website, just Google resilience roadmap, and it will take you to the guidance sheet for each industry that is opening up. It's about a five page sheet that includes everything from um, uh, uh, protocols for employees to social distancing protocols to signage that you need to have. And it, it's quite helpful. So I would encourage any business to go to that. Um, and then council member story as to your second question about a residence requirement for beaches. Um, I'll, I'll answer that. The harder part of that question first and the easy part last. The harder part of that question is I would bet that that approach could implicate some constitutional issues that I have not yet analyzed, but I think it would be very difficult for us to enforce that. The easy answer to that question though is that 
it, that would be um, a, a regulation that is less restrictive than what the county has implemented. The county has said that beaches are closed um, for sedentary activities from, I think it's 11 a.m. or 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., I think. The city cannot implement anything that is less restrictive than that. Any change to that regulation has to come from the county. There was one other question, part of your question, Council Member Story. You mentioned the kiosks, and I'm not, can you, can you help me understand? I'm, I didn't, I'm not immediately... Oh, you, you know, the summer vendor out on that one on. The rental oh, the, of course. The car, yeah. Yes. So the question is. Does that qualify for, and, you know, and Sam here just mentioned a, a source for the guidelines, and you can certainly check that out. But, yeah, I was wondering if that would qualify as a as curbside pickup. So. My my belief is that for retail sales, it potentially could if it was food, if it's an allowed activity. Um, unfortunately, though, the primary activity from the from the Esplanade vendor is uh, rentals, equipment rentals, and equipment rentals isn't allowed isn't a, an allowed business activity at this stage in this phase that we're in right now. So, if all they were doing was selling selling stuff conceivably that would be allowed as sort of a curbside pickup provided they could um, meet the other criteria outlined by the governor uh, and again if it was food again maybe that same same answer but for the outdoor sports equipment rental that isn't isn't currently an allowed business that's correct i've seen no indication that any rental business is allowed which makes sense in this stage any business the businesses that are allowed are businesses that give the customer a product and the product and the customer takes the product away there there are, there's just no indication at all that businesses that rent products are permitted at this stage okay thank you thank you council member Story. i have a question uh one second council member tron uh council member Botorf had his hand up and i think council member uh, vice mayor brooks may have but uh, i'll come i'll put you on the list council member bertrand but let's go to council member Botorf because i know he had his hand up uh thank you mayor uh when we were going back was mentioned about the war <clears throat> uh, correct me if i'm wrong but is it was fishing isn't fishing one of the water activities that's allowed on our beaches so Unfortunately, I've received conflicting information on that, and we're going to be speaking to the health officer about it tomorrow. So there's, uh, under, uh, my understanding is, is that uh, we've asked the question from two different piece, arms of the county, and we've gotten two different answers. So we need to get a, get a clear direction and figure out what the plan is with fishing. I thought it was allowed, but we were hearing um, that it may not be. Okay, because I, I my question was based on the assumption of the I don't know what makes the work any different, although it might be more of a challenge keeping the social distancing on the beach, I mean, on the water. So I'll let you continue to look in that, and then we'll see how that plays out. Thank you very much for that answer. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, did you have your hand up? I wasn't sure if I... No? Okay, my apologies. And we're going to move on to uh, Council Member Bertrand. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I'm having problems. I, I raised my hand and lowered my hand, but I didn't get that. Thump. I lost my capability here. So, um, you know, I met with the merchants earlier this week, um, and one of the going away concerns is their supposed inability to communicate with the city and express their concerns, which is why I asked for a special meeting to do so. I, I thought there would be many more comments from them, at least that was what was promised, and I think many more will come as they realize they can do it. So my question to Jamie is, how is uh, Rich Hill's uh, participation going to help in terms of communicating with the merchants? What's being planned here? So there's a couple things. The first step has been forming this, this committee that Rich is gonna be working with. Um, the second step is we're meeting with BIA representatives uh, for a Zoom meeting on Monday morning. We'll be talking about kind okay. of what their needs and communication is. We will also be pushing this website out, which they can share with um, other business members. And then the committee, I think, is gonna be part of it, honestly, is, is we're gonna be relying on the committee that, that's been formed 
to help spread the word and communicate with other businesses that they in industry groups that they represent so for example we have retail shop owners longtime retail shop owners we have restaurant owners we have hotel operators we have um, uh, gym owners I'm thinking that those are the broad oh and then we have some one of the major property owners in town so it's a pretty broad-based coalition that, that I hope can help us uh, expand our level of communication with the businesses yeah, I, I think this is great. I, I commend you for putting that together. Thank you. Great. So just to be clear, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks mentioned that during comments of asking the BIA, so the BIA normally would be on next week's agenda for our notice of intent to levy the BIA assessment. And so I heard a request to put um, that on general business and ask for the BIA to come and give us a little bit of an update about their status at the next meeting. Is that is is that the plan? Is that the is that where everyone's comfortable? Okay, I will that, take that. Yes, yeah, that was my request at the discretion of our mayor, of course. Yeah, of course. I believe they're on the schedule for the eleventh of June. I did not hear you right, Jamie. You said next week's meeting. Sorry, two weeks. Two weeks from now. Oh. It feels like they come every week at this point. Um, I did have one more question, or um, or at least request. I, I really like the um, the mayor's group coming together. Um, like I mentioned earlier, one of those members, I believe, that will be sitting on this new group uh, is also the representative for the county's economic council. And so ideally, and maybe this is to Council Member Fertron's kind of request or what he was looking for, is that ideally what I would like to see is that this cohort create ideas, suggestions, and so forth that this uh, that this representative can bring to the county um, to bring forward to the county's um, economic council. So that was just my my hope, and I'm I'm assuming that's the that's what was going to that was the intention. Uh, yeah, I make a comment, Madam Mayor. Yes, yes, of course. Let me just uh, address Councilwoman uh, Vice Mayor Brooks's uh, comment real quickly. It's my understanding, and I'll have the city manager correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, um, that the the mayor's committee will focus on Capitola specific issues. And then, yes, when I spoke to um, to the committee members who are also on the county uh, task force, that they felt that it would be beneficial to have some form of continuity so that they could bring the the concerns and ideas spoken about at the Capitola meeting to the larger uh, county meeting. That's that's my understanding, yeah. So my comment was, um, I did check out the uh, economic development department from the county, and they have a huge number of resources. So I passed that on to about three or so members of the BIA. And you know, my response was, they're very thankful to find out that the county is actually providing a lot of resources. And so in terms of communication with Rich Hill and the committee that's being formed, I think that's one of their concerns. They don't know what's available. Um, in many cases, they're running their businesses day to day and how much time do they actually have to do the deep dive to find out what's available. Um, they sort of know because they look at news that things are available. And so our committee, I think, would be great in that regard, you know. Um, the resources that are available, and I think Yvette mentioned the um, small business group with, uh, excuse me, at Cabrillo. I mean, there, there's a lot of resources here that generally people don't know about. And that's our role is to help them find out about those resources. Thank you. Absolutely, and I think that our business liaison is gonna, gonna really uh, spearhead that effort for our um, uh, business recovery task force, absolutely. And I will add, we, we do have another item that's coming up later on tonight's agenda <clears throat> about applying for some CDBG funding, which, pretend, which, which if the council agrees, could be made available for some micro loans to help assist local businesses. It's not a ton of money, but that's another item that we would be um, helping to get the word out through these programs uh, to the community. All right, any additional questions before we bring this to public comment? Councilmember Story. Yeah, thank you again, Mayor. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the beach closure. Um, 
and one confirming that the governor's order does not close beaches throughout the state. Um, and uh, as I understand, some of them are open. And so we have a closure based on the Santa Cruz County's more restrictive uh, approach. Um, and if that's the case, um, and I know, Kristen, you mentioned that you're going to be maybe meeting with the county officials uh, tomorrow, but what is the local plan for um, uh, the beach? Um, is it scheduled to stay closed during this summer? Um, uh, or and, and if there is going to be a relaxing of the restrictions, what, what are the kind of trigger points um, that the county is looking at before moving uh, to opening the beach? You want to answer that? Or? I'll take a stab at it. So one of the things is I know that the governor, um, I think it was about two weeks ago, was actually looking very seriously at closing beaches statewide. Um, and frankly, I, I, my understanding is behind the scenes, there was conversations with many of the health officers in the counties, coastal counties up and down the state. And I think realistically, the, the fact that we didn't get a statewide closure of the beaches was that the county health officers basically were able to assuage the governor that, that they got this. And so that was, I think, to some degree, the health order that we've seen now that does close the beach during the block of time in the middle of the day, leaves the water open um, and keeps keeps the beach open in the morning for, for uh, exercise in the evening. What the metrics would be to open that, um, I don't know. And that's a question we will have for the health officer. We'll talk a little bit with her about that tomorrow in our weekly call with her, the mayor and I. Um, but at this point, I think that even though there isn't a statewide beach closure, I suspect that, that if the governor sitting in Sacramento was seeing big crowds show up at the beaches that I mean, he has he exhibited his willingness to close the beaches in Orange County several weeks ago, that that would probably be relatively shortly around the corner. Um, and I guess I would also note that this order that the health officer put together is, is very nuanced. Um, you know, it's not as much of a cudgel as we faced in over the Easter week, where all beaches and open spaces in the entire county were closed, including the water. Um, so I encourage that the public health officer has taken a more nuanced approach to try to respond to some local concerns. I completely understand that it's not situation normal uh, and it has a very dramatic impact on a lot of people's lives as it stands. So we will continue to pose that question to the health officer and any clarity we can get about how long this will last, we will certainly share with the council and the community. Great, thank you. I just, I think it's very important that um, we give the public as much information about when they may, what's going to happen this summer at the beach and when they may expect that it's going to be open. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from members of the council? Seeing none, we'll bring this to public comment. See if we received any virtual public comment on this item. Okay. Looks like we've received one. Why doesn't the county request the variance do business with proper protocol can go further into stage two? Every day is a tremendous lifeline to our small businesses. Sandra Jordan. Area code 83147. Great, so we've received public comment on this item. Uh, again, that's the variance is something that we're going to be uh, discussing with the county tomorrow to determine if we were going to be uh, requesting that variance or not. My understanding, as the city attorney mentioned, is that we have not yet, but we will be asking uh, the county health officer about that decision tomorrow and have further information. And uh, if, if I may add to that, Madam Mayor, uh, I actually had that same question and emailed the county council prior to this meeting to ask what the status was with Santa Cruz County requesting a variance. And he indicated that um, although the county's numbers are good countywide, the county is not meeting a couple of the governor's key benchmarks. Um, and that Santa Cruz County is closer than any other Bay Area county, but we are not there yet. Um, so. 
hopefully you'll be able to find out more information. My understanding, again, is that no large county in the state has yet met the benchmark. Okay, so that, that answers some questions of why we haven't tried to move into stage two yet. It's because we're not eligible to. But it looks that, like that, Oh, yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. We're not there yet. Okay, great. And hopefully we'll get more information about that tomorrow. And actually, I, I got another email from um, another city attorney in the area who had additional information who indicated that it's her understanding that um, from the health press conference this morning, the county is about four weeks away from meeting the criteria for requesting a variant. Mm -hmm. That could likely change by the day. So, um, Madam Mayor, you might get more updated information tomorrow. Okay, great. Okay. Well, we'll find out tomorrow what the uh, updated information is, which, and unless, um, uh, Madam City Attorney, do you happen to know which of the um, standards for the variants we aren't meeting? Did they tell you which of those standards we haven't met yet? What I have heard, and again, this is secondhand, that, that the biggest hurdle is contact tracers, that we need 40, but at this point we only have 15, and we should be able to meet that uh, metric in a month. Uh, does, uh, uh, Jamie, have you heard anything in addition to that or different from that? I believe it was the contact tracing, and I couldn't remember if it was the PPE or the testing, but I did hear that the contact tracing, we weren't there yet based on the governor's um, the, the, the requirements to move into the, the second parts of phase two. Okay. I, I know that's an issue in other counties as well. Great. All right. Uh, no additional public comment, Kevin? I think that was it. We can... Gotta make sure. Okay. Seeing no additional uh, public comment, we are now closing public comment for this item. And we'll bring it back to council for additional comment and for a vote. Let me try to get my window so I can see everyone here. All right. Um, I'll just go down the line for this one rather than hand raising and, and we'll do a council member story. Do you have any additional comments? No additional comments. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks, do you have any additional comments? I have none, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Botorf, any additional comments? I have no comments, but I'd like to make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Thank you. We have a motion. And I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Council Member Bertrand, any additional comments? You're muted. Give me a thumbs up if you don't have any additional comments. I will tell, okay, cool, that works. Okay, uh, with that, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Bertrand. He's giving a thumbs up, does Great. that count? Um, <laughs> uh, do we need a verbal, I think we need a verbal. we need a verbal for the remote. Can we unmute right. our... Uh... Mm. There Thank you. Yes. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Botorf? Aye. Council Member Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to item 8B uh, Council Compensation Decision to Decline Adjustment. All right. Okay, so this item is on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the agenda at the request of Mayor Peterson. Um, earlier, well, in 2019, at the end of the year, council voted for an increase to uh, increase the salary by adopting Ordinance 1032. And then based on the economic impacts of the pandemic, uh, Mayor Peterson requested that we put an item on the agenda to defer that increase. Um, government Code Section 36516 allows council members to waive any or all um, any or all of their compensation and so rather than bringing forward a municipal code amendment at this time staff is suggesting that council members um, could agree here at this meeting uh, to waive to waive that increase um, it is an individual action it isn't necessarily an entire council action so if it wasn't something that all the council members wanted to do as an alternative, oh, we could bring back an ordinance amendment. 
uh, certainly could do that at the council's direction. Um, the savings of do, the, the potential savings, I guess, is about seven thousand dollars if the entire council member um, waives the increase. Members waive the increase. So that's my recommendation: is, is that the council members would affirm that they, the salary increase pending um, in the new year would not be accepted. And alternatively, if you'd like, we could come back with an actual ordinance amendment to remove that that old the, the section of code uh, increasing the compensation. And with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, council members, any questions? Go ahead and raise your hand. And seeing none. Okay, seeing none, we will bring this to public comment. Have we received any public comment on this item? No public comment. Okay, public comment on this item is now closed. We'll bring it back to the council for discussion and a vote. Uh, let's start at the other end then. Let's, uh, Council Member Botworth. Any comments? I have no comments. I'm not clear about the action you want. Are we just going to vote to, uh, to not accept the, uh, the, 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 the raise and not do a, a motion? Yeah. I was unclear on that. That's a good point. Do we need to actually vote to not accept that or do we just need to go down the line and say, I don't, I don't want the increase? I think the most technical answer is, is that each, if each council member affirms that they don't want the increase, that that's what we need. Okay, so let's start with Council Member Botorf. I affirm that I do not want the increase. Thank you. Council Member Bertrand. Uh, we've got, uh, you're muted, Council Member Bertrand. There we go. Now you're on. I here. affirm the same. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks. I agree with staff recommendation. Council Member Story. Yes, I'll waive the increase. Thank you, and I will also waive the increase. So all council members unanimously agree to waive the uh, the increase for the coming year. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, we're gonna move on to item 8C, Recreation Summer Programs Update. Okay. Right. Are you, oh, so Nikki, are you gonna run it from where you are? Um, yeah, that was what I was planning to do. Does that work? Yeah. So do you want to share okay. your screen with everybody? Yes. I'm not sure why it's not jumping to... There we go. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, the item before you tonight is a summer program update. Um, so to begin with, as many of us are aware, um, summer programs were able to begin a planning process um, with the county health order that was issued on May 1st. Um, so in this health order, there were a few things that really outlined um, what the summer programs would be for the summer. The first one is the beach closure, as we've talked about this evening, uh, that is closed from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. So we need to take into consideration the beach closure for our program. And then um, in regarding to the operation of programs and collecting use and staff operations, there were a set of rules that um, each program needed to conform to. And so these are that stable groups um, of 12 or fewer children. So children cannot move from one group to another um, and they cannot mix with any other group. So within, if they are in with a group, they need to maintain a social distance from any other group that exists in the same program. Um, and then staff that are assigned to each group need to be able to remain with that particular group for the duration of the session. Um, I have also been in uh, several collaborative meetings with 
the other recreation districts in Santa Cruz County and the county health officer has participated in those meetings, providing additional clarification and answers to questions so for best operation of the program. Um, in that meeting, she has made it clear for us that participants within their stable group do not need to maintain social distancing and that they would be able to share supplies and equipment within um, that stable group. In the event that any supplies and equipment were to be transferred to a different stable group, they would need to go through a complete sanitation process before they could be shared amongst any individual group within the same program. Um, so taking into consideration a lot of the information that has been provided in the order, provided in these meetings, and that collaboration of the recreation districts as we talk through the best practices for program operations, um, I have developed the modifications for Camp Capitola as well as Junior Guards. And so I'm going to take you through Camp Capitola. Um, for, first of all, we're going to run Camp Capitola in four sessions. Each session will be two weeks in length, which is normal for a typical camp session. Um, program will begin on June 15th, which is the anticipated date that we would have um, started from the program. Uh, groups will be of 10 participants and one staff and one youth volunteer, which we refer to as junior leaders. Um, for Camp Capitola, I made the decision to have it be 10 participants because um, having one staff work with all those 10 youth, um, I felt pushing it to the maximum of 12 would make it particularly challenging on that staff and their group management, as well as for our ECA accreditation. Um, we have previously stated and are required to have a one to 10 ratio. Um, so participants are for Camp Cavitola is ages six to 12, which is the standard um, uh, compared to other summers. That's what we would typically offer to. Uh, youth volunteers are ages 15 to 17. We made a slight modification. Typically, it would be 14 to 17, but we decided to um, make them a little older for this particular summer with the necessary responsibility for the junior leader would need to follow. Um, this program will provide for 70 participants, or another way of thinking about that is seven groups in each session. Um, which will offer a total of 280 participants program over the summer. Uh, this program will operate from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., which is um, actually uh, a half hour earlier than maybe what we would typically offer, but a little, it releases a little earlier than we have an option. Um, Again, because of the staffing structure of this program, then we are not able to provide early care or aftercare or be able to provide half-day programs. Um, so in order to operate this program, we will be hiring seven leaders and a coordinator and an assistant coordinator. Um, we will be operating on the established fee schedule of $289 for a resident and $361 for a non-resident. Um, now, a typical summer would have anticipated a revenue, excuse me, of $140,000 um, with a direct wage expense of $105,000. This summer, the anticipated revenue is $95,000 with a direct wage expense of $78,000. All right, moving on to the modifications for the Junior Guard program. Um, so this program uh, was um, particularly challenging in consideration of the beach closure 
and the restrictions on the group size. And so modifications to this program have been a lot more extreme in order to conform to the necessary criteria. Um, and to start with, all so sessions will be two weeks long and we will be providing four sessions throughout the summer. Now, typically junior guards would be, the, the numbers would be opposite. We would provide a four week long session and we would provide two of them each summer. However, uh, we felt that with the restrictive number that we would be able to provide, we wanted to try and provide to the most participants that we could and so therefore make this modification so that we might be able to open it up to more um, participants. Each group will consist of 12 participants and have two instructors and one youth volunteer um, assigned to that consistent group. Uh, the youth volunteer is the group that would typically be U19 or the captain, captain sport. Um, each session will have a capacity of 60 participants, or another way of thinking of that is five groups of 12, um, for a total of 240 participants for the summer, um, which is about a quarter of the number of participants that we would typically serve in this program throughout the summer. Uh, because of that, we are asking that participants only register for one session so that we can offer this program to as many people as we are able to. And in the event that um, we didn't fill up, then we would open up the remaining spaces to anybody that is already enrolled in the program. Uh, the program will operate from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., Monday through Friday. And because of the uh, restrictions, there will be no afternoon sessions available, and we will not be participating in any competition uh, for the summer. So the plan would be to hire 10 instructors and also two subs that we will train in the event that any um, staff member were to be injured or become ill, we would have those subs trained and ready to fill in. Uh, we would also have a coordinator and an assistant coordinator. Um, in preparation for that hiring, we will be conducting a swim test with Central, who is on the call. Um, would you have any questions for them? Um, we'll be conducting a swim test um, in Two, uh, two dates, May 16th and May 23rd. Um, and then the training for those staff will begin June 8th. Um, we will be operating on the established fee schedule, which is $260 for residents and $325 for non-residents. In a typical summer, the anticipated revenue for the Junior Guard program would be $275,000 um, with a direct wage expense of about 143,000. This summer, uh, the anticipated revenue of this modification is 121,000 with a direct wage expense of 101,000. Um, so, Earlier, well, last week, uh, staff received direction um, from a budget hearing regarding the um, TOT dedicated early childhood and youth fund, which um, currently has a uh, $5,200 remaining for this current fiscal budget. Um, to support the summer programs, uh, this fund could potentially be moved to a scholarship fund. And the Capitola Public and Safety, Capitola Public Safety and Community Service Foundation, um, who would typically process the scholarship pro uh, applications for the Junior Guard program and for has offered to process additional applications for summer programs if additional funds were made available. Um, 
that any unused funds could be rolled over to the uh, next fiscal budget, the 2021 fiscal budget that we're currently um, in hearings about. And um, regarding the rest of the requests from council, additional recommendations will be brought um, to uh, the May 21st budget hearing. Uh, this happens to be um, a decision that would have needed to be made quickly, um, which is why it is in this presentation. Um, so in regards to the total uh, recreation budget, these summer program modifications result in a reduction of recreation revenues of $199,000, um, which is currently being offset by a reduction in expenditures by um, of a 69,000, which is resulting in a net general fund impact of negative 130,000 or um, cutting into the general fund by that amount. And um, these impacts have been included in the proposal um, for the fiscal 2021 budget. So staff recommendation uh, to receive the report to modified programs and to allocate the uh, 5,200 from the TOT dedicated early childhood and youth fund to a summer program scholarship front. And with that, I am available for questions. Great. And I can stop the share. All right, if there's any council members that have questions, uh, now is the time, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Nikki, for that presentation. I just sat on the Childhood Advisory Council um, meeting today and was informed that many summer programs are not going to be taking place. Um, so this is wonderful that you would be bringing this forward to us today. My question is regarding the, um, the Junior Guard program and the ages. Um, this year, it seems that you increased the starting age to seven years old. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, so um, I did, in, in the staff report, it does say for age seven. Um, and the way we run a registration for the Junior Guard program um, is we're, we're not doing anything different than we would do a typical summer. And so typically we would open registration by opening it up for um, returning residents first. And then the next day it would open up registration for returning non-residents. And then the third day of registration would open it up to new residents. And um, we're keeping with that same pattern in order to just kind of stick to what we would, some things that we would typically do. That third day of registration um, is typically when those six-year-olds would get the opportunity to enroll uh, because they would be new to the program, but they would be residents or non-residents. Um, and so a while at the moment, um, if a six-year-old were to register for the program um, because they had previously been in the program, we wouldn't be preventing them from um, entering into the program. However, because of the low numbers, low amount of spaces that we have available, I am not seeing that it will be likely that many six-year-olds will be in the program. It's totally possible that there could be some remaining spaces by the time we get to that third stage of registration and we wouldn't be preventing them by any means. Um, but the likelihood um, might be low and I was cautious about getting individuals hopes up because we're already in a circumstance where I think a lot of people are going to have hopes for a program and are unfortunately not having spaces for that. 
I just have two more questions. Um, the other question is, what if something changes um, with the beaches or come tomorrow they say, you know, the hours for recreation time are being extended? Are you, um, are you prepared to make any changes or this would be pretty much that? Um, in, in short, yes, I would be prepared. There would be steps that would have to uh, happen. So um, right now, what we've kind of set up is that we would have these 10 staff, ooh, excuse me, and those 10 staff, they cannot work with multiple groups. So in the event that, let's say, the beach closures were to change and we were suddenly to be able to open an afternoon session, for example, the staff that worked in the morning cannot work with the group in the afternoon. It would have to be a completely separate group of staff. Um, and I have talked with Captain Harway about what what would happen if we would be if we would have to suddenly train more staff? Would that be possible? Um, and so there are some ideas out there, um, and that we would be able to try and problem solve. I've gotten pretty good at problem solving this particular problem lately. Um, so I feel confident that given a different set of criteria, I might be able to have a workaround. Whether how long it would be able to be offered um, is kind of the question. If it was how how many sessions it would be, how many weeks it would be before we would be able to offer something. But through the normal registration process, we will likely generate a wait list. So I feel confident that we would have an idea of to how many people would still be interested in a program if we were to be able to open additional space. Okay, and then my last question is, you mentioned for the summer program that you follow particular guidelines, um, um, and that was the reason you were keeping the ratio to 10. Um, so is that not, are those not guidelines for the junior guard program either? Um, for, are you, uh, referring to the ACA guidelines that I had mentioned? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, no. For the American Camp Association accreditation that we went through last summer, um, they have ratio guidelines for staff to campers, and those are currently at a 1 to 10. Um, for, per USLA, um, their ratios for junior guards is a 1 to 20 for the older youth and a 1 to 15 for the little guard interest, which is a larger ratio than what the current health order allows, which is why it is a reduction in the spaces that we are allowed to provide, whereas the APA ratio and so the camp program actually sits and supports really well with the current county guidelines. Did I lose? Am I frozen? Vice Mayor Brooks, did that answer your question? Is Vice Mayor Brooks frozen? Or am I? I think she's frozen. Yeah, I think she's frozen. We'll come back to you. Okay, so we're gonna uh, move on to Council Member Story and then Council Member Bertrand, and we will come back to uh, Vice Mayor Brooks once we can get her unfrozen. Council Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for that report and um, bringing forth the, you know these youth opportunities. Uh, my question goes to uh, the status of the beach. Um, will you be able to function if the lagoon is not closed? Um, and therefore, you have less beach uh, to be able to use, um, both in time and space. That's a great question. Um, so I do feel confident that with the current um, way we're staffing and the current numbers uh, in the program, that having the small beach and the lagoon going through the beach will be something that will work around. 
but I don't think that it's going to cause um, a serious problem to the program. Whereas typically in a junior guard session, we would have about 250 kids on the beach and um, at a time. And in this circumstance, we're gonna have about 60. And those 60 kids are gonna be in their small little groups and they can't actually be close to each other. We want them to be far apart. So the fact that they could spread out and go where they kind of need to go in order to do their activities um, will benefit them. So I feel like it'll, it, it, it will be a mild inconvenience. Okay, thank you. All right, Council Member Bertrand. Question about training and also a question about competition. So I guess the training question goes to uh, Santa Cruz and the captains here appreciate it coming. Um, I just wanna hear, I would suspect the training of some, the same level, any alterations? Just wanna get that confirmation for the public. Yeah, Scott, do you, would you like to answer um, Council Member Bertrand? Definitely, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Central Fire is prepared to come and do exactly the same training that we did last year. Um, even though that the numbers uh, of instructors and the numbers of actual junior guard participants will be reduced, we're still upheld to the standards set by uh, the USLA guidelines to make sure that we meet those. So the training that we'll be providing this year um, will be exactly to the same standard of what it was that you guys saw last year. So Central Fire is excited for that. Hey, thanks very much, I expected that. The other question is, um, Nikki, you said no competition. I just want a little elaboration. I mean, some of the activities are competitive in nature, like flags, for instance. Were you referring to no competition with other beaches, um, like up and down California? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, you're exactly right. Um, there, at the moment, it is possible that Capitola may be the only um, junior guard program that is happening in our county. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has already made the decision that they are not going to operate their junior guard program. And um, the state junior guard program, they will be making decisions, I believe the last date I heard was June 1st. Um, about whether or not they are planning to run any junior art program on their beach. Um, the last update that I heard was that for the regional competition, um, while that beach was still willing to host in the event that um, circumstances allowed, at the moment, there is no plan for that regional competition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions? No additional questions? Okay, we're gonna bring this item to uh, public comment then. Have we received any public comment on this item? So share screen, share. Here's that we have an uh, item. Okay. How is the Junior Guard program going to operate and function if the city has no plan to grade or create an appropriate safe beach setting? Thank you. Matt Arthur. C. Area Code 831-81820. Alright, any additional public comments? That's it. That's it. Alright, public comment for this item uh, is now closed. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, before we move on to comments, if we can... Um, uh, address the uh, the comment regarding the beach grading and if it will be safe for for junior guards to participate. Sure. Um, Nikki, do you want to take that? Otherwise, I can. Um, yeah. So I in previously discussing the type of activities that we are going to be able to do. Um, with the individual groups, um, we felt confident that 
we would being able to move about the beach um, and make modifications. Typically, the junior guard program would kind of use a corner of the beach and and um, have kind of their established space. And since the ultimate goal is to keep them distance from other groups with their stable staff, we thought that their ability to be able to spread out on the beach and move to certain areas and avoid um, any potential hazards, rocks, debris, um, that they would be able to modify and, and take that into consideration. There's also a number of activities that because of the way that equipment would be shared, um, we wouldn't be able to do. And so there'd be a lot of water activity, there'd be ocean safety discussions, there'd be in-group um, fitness activities, but being able to use the spaces that are available to them on the beach. And Jimmy, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add to that. I think the only thing I would add is, is that um, while we're calling this a junior guard program, I think it's going to be very different from the way the junior guard program traditionally operates. So it's going to require a little bit of adjustment and on the fly um, uh, adaptation as the program moves forward. And obviously it's just, it's going to be different. We don't, aren't going to have a big, huge beach to work off of, but there's a lot of activities we will be able to do. So I think that that's probably the best answer I can give at this stage. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we are now coming back to uh, the council for additional uh, comments and uh, there's no vote, correct? This is just an update. Oh no, I'm sorry, there is. Consider allocation. Okay, let's bring it back to council now for a uh, discussion and a vote. Uh, council member Bertrand, I see your hands up. Let's unmute council member Bertrand and then we're gonna go to council, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks after that. Okay, yeah, I just want to thank you, Nikki, for, as you said, solving the problem <laughs> and um, bringing this back. It's very important to Capitola residents that the program continues, even in a modified way, and um, the kids mostly. Thank you. And I would like to make a motion to do the uh, fund transfer and accept this program. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Motion by Council Member Bertrand, uh, seconded by Council Story. Uh, Council Member Story. Uh, we're going to continue discussion. Uh, let's see, Council Member Botorf, any uh, additional comments? Is that a thumbs up? Because you're good with. Your yeah, no, I, I have a quick comment. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mickey, I just want to say what an exceptional job you've done here. This is obviously, you know, you may not want to call it a junior guard program, but. But I want to commend you and uh, Central Fire uh, Chief Hall, Captain Harway. Thank you for all the time and effort you put into to trying to make this happen. I think you all realize that this is a time when we have no money and it's a time when we're kind of making lemons out of lemonade. So uh, I think that uh, the future for us is going to be a lot of tough budget cuts. And the fact that we're going to make this stretch to uh, support youth, I think should send a strong message to the citizens of Capitola but we're trying to keep our priorities in order right here. And so uh, I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you. And my apologies, um, Vice Mayor Brooks, I had you next on the, the list and I skipped over you. Okay. Um, I apologize to Mickey for um, freezing on you. I lost connection for a second. Must have been a UFO flying over my house. Um, so I, again, I'm, I'm echoing what everyone is saying that this program is very much needed and it will be very much appreciated by so many families in our community and in, throughout the entire county. I would like to suggest though that we, um, if uh, Council Member Bertrand would be open, open to a friendly amendment that we extend the Junior Guard program to begin, um, well, not to begin, but maybe do just allow a threshold of 10, six-year-olds, maybe start with that or five, and I, I'm looking to Nikki for some guidance on this um, even further. I, because this is kind of what we've done in the past, and I know that there's a lot of kiddos who would be interested, and because of their age, it's not like they were, um, that they were able to participate the year before, so they wouldn't fall under that category as returning members because they just turned six. So 
Um, I, I would like to offer friendly amendments to at least allow 10 six-year-olds from the get uh, out the gate to apply for the program. Um, and that would be my, my um, friendly amendment. Council Member Bertrand, uh, do you accept that? Yeah, I'd like to see what Nikki's take is on this. I, I have no problem with extending uh, the age group, but you know, it is under different circumstances. And I heard your explanation that we haven't done that in the, I mean, we don't have any six year olds that would be, you know, new ones. They would be still in the third, third rank of um, signups. So um, in terms of this, it would be continuing later, you know, for a number of years later. So I just want to get your take on this. Yeah. Um, so I, the level of detail, let me know if it's too much detail, but um, in order to do that, what we would need to do is essentially create an individual group of six year olds that we would um, allow to become available in that third round of registration. Um, and so I, I would be concerned because it would be a small number um, and the, you know, it, it's already kind of a quagmire of fairness um, because of the limited number of spaces that are available, but we could totally create um, a additional session that would come available in that third round of registration and um, and then and and just have that be fitted because the system can have age restrictions. So that's kind of to that answer. I hope I explained that clearly. So I have a question. Normally, normally we don't have six-year-olds, right? And so we, we haven't really accommodated them in the past. But you say that you could actually have a sort of a cohort that you would create for this. Not exactly. Um, so typically, in a typical summer, six-year-olds would be new participants into the junior guard program. Okay. And the way that we have done registration in the past is that we've done it over the course of four days. Mostly because the registration can't, the system cannot handle a thousand people logging on to register, but as well as a way to implement a measure of fairness because it is such a popular program, we have broken it out for four days, starting with um, people that are returning to the program and then residents has been on the first day. The second day has been um, returning non-residents, and then the third day has been new residents, um, and then the fourth day is non new non-residents. Um, so that that has been the typical pattern, and so yes, we have had six-year-olds in the past. It's just that usually their day to register doesn't fall until the third round of registration. Okay, so basically, you could you could handle Yvette's request. It just could mean something way at the end, and it's going to be a small cohort, perhaps. Yeah, but it would be it would be controlling it would be controlling the numbers. We would specifically be fixing the registration system to hold those spaces. Okay, I, I have no problem with the uh, friendly with the friendly amendment. So I'll accept that. And uh, who, who did we have? Sam, uh, Council Member Story, I believe, seconded that. Or are you? Um, yes, I see your hand up. Yeah, right yeah, I was, I was the second. And I guess before I accepted that, I would like to hear a little bit from Nikki about the budgetary implications, um, and specifically whether six-year-olds require a higher ratio um, instructor to um, mm -hmm. participant, and uh, which would kind of throw off our are the budgetary um, figures that have been presented to us? Um, that's a good question. It's, in, in a normal summer, they would fall under a ratio of a one to 15 because they would be put 
in a, they're, they're considered middle guards. And under the USLA ratios, their ratio is a one to 15. Um, now, the staffing structure is very different in a normal summer as well, where we would have instructors working directly with the youth, and then we would also have instructors that would be um, kind of lifeguarding um, during activities or swims and that sort of stuff. And having this, this staffing set up is two instructors who are USLA trained, um, they are doing everything with their small group of 12 youth. And um, one of the aspects is going to be swimming. And we did feel that having two guards with those groups is really important because of the circumstance where someone maybe doesn't want to get in the water and they're having trouble struggling. And how do you keep the program going um, without suddenly focusing around that one youth? And a six-year-old might throw that balance off a little bit more, but I think that if you were to pair them with other similar age youth, um, it would it would work out okay, considering we would also have the U19 um, volunteer. So it would definitely be, I would choose, I would be very selective as the staff that would have that group. Um, staff that would be very experienced in working with that age group. Um, but as far as the ratios are concerned, I think that we're covered. And, and that wouldn't significantly change the kind of revenue to expense proportions among the six-year-old group either? No, it would have almost no budgetary impact. Okay. Hearing that, I'll accept, um, you know, the friendly amendment. You know, my last comment is that my daughter started at six and she loved the program. Well run then, so I think I'm perfectly fine with that age group. Wonderful. Okay, uh, Council Member Bothorf, we haven't heard from you yet. Oh, you've heard from me, but I, I, I was all in favor of this until the amendment and I'm, I'm cautiously uh, treading, tread, treading water on this one. <laughs> Before I complete my comment, I'd like to have the city manager weigh in on his uh, input on uh, on this modification, and then I'll make a comment. Well, I think that the staff recommendation with the age range not having the six-year-olds, not even sort of getting people's expectations up, um, that they would be able to sign up as a first-time enrollee, I think that was a well-reasoned recommendation. Um, at the same time, I also appreciate the notion that six-year-olds who may have been looking forward to junior guards wouldn't be given the opportunity to participate at all given the small enrollment. So, I, you know, I, I think it's fine to set aside a couple of the spaces. We will maintain a waiting list as we always do. So if we don't get the six-year-olds to sign up, then we will be able to fill the spaces. Um, so I think, I think at the end of the day, it's kind of this policy call. You know, it really comes down to the priorities, right? The way we do, um, Nikki talked about the sort of different stages of priority we typically go through in terms of who gets when to sign up. This is really saying that there's gonna be 10 returners who may not be able to sign up now, but we are gonna give some slots for six-year-olds. And so I think in that sense, I think it's a fine decision to make for the council one way or another, either way. Thank you, Mr. City Manager, for those comments. Uh, Nikki, well, when you make the presentation, uh, I detected nothing but confidence in your voice, which makes me feel good about what you're presenting. Uh, likewise, from Central Fire, um, they haven't weighed in on this, and I'm probably you know, going to speculate that they don't have a problem with it. Uh, and seems uh, the chief shaking his head a little bit, so I'm just going to take that at that. Um, I, I, I'm a little have a little reservation when you pause, Nikki, because you're normally. Uh, very exuberant and make us all feel good about what you're delivering. A little reservation there from the city manager. Not my intent to cut out anybody. I think you said that there was a provision on the last day that if we didn't fill the spot, that the six-year-olds would be able to apply. And I'm not sure that I'm liking that what you just hinted at was that some people might not get, that were there last year, might not get in because we were now creating spots for six-year-olds. So I'm feeling like, we have two programs that are working against each other. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure how I feel. Um, 
I like it better when you are just, you know, smiling from ear to ear and, you know, you have your quick answers and you feel, you feel really, really good about it. So I'm a little mixed on this, uh, uh, on this, on this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bator. Um, any additional uh, comments from the council? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have a motion and a second. I believe, let me just backtrack, we already took this to public comment, correct? Because we had it read from the, yes, thank that you. That is correct. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have a motion and a second, so let's do a roll call vote. It, do you want to clarify it? Oh, I'm sorry. You want to clarify? So I believe the motion is the staff recommendation with a friendly amendment to set aside six spaces, 10 spaces for six year olds. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Is that correct? I see. Yep. yep. Okay. Council member Bertrand. Aye. Council member Bator. Aye. Council member Story. Aye. Vice mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to item 8D, CDBG CV grant resolution. Okay. Turn it over to staff. All right. Um, thank you, Mayor Peterson and Council. Um, it's a pleasure to be before you tonight with this item. On March 27th, um, uh, Congress passed the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, to support preparation for and response to the community impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. The state of California received approximately $19 million in CARES Act money. Disbursement of the funds will be um, from the California Department of Housing and Com Community Development, HCD, through the Community Development Block Grant Program, CDBG. So one requirement for a CBDG grant application is to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to submit an application to administer the grant. Um, tonight's discussion will be at a very high level as moving forward with this, we're moving forward with the resolution before actually the NOFA, which is your notice of funding availability, has been published by the state HCD. So we're trying to get ahead of the application process because it has to go to two public hearings and should the NOFA open and the application open, we want to be ready to go and ready to submit our application. Um, the other thing of note with moving forward is that there is some flexibility. Uh, the, the funds for the CBDG's CV fun funds are not set in stone at this point. So um, let's first talk about the amount of available funds. One requirement of the CBDG CV funds is that any existing program income funds must be utilized prior to the CBDG, TG, the, we'll call it the COVID funds. The great news is that they're allowing us to reutilize our program income funds towards the CV funds. Uh, luckily, we had a CBDG down payment assistance loan paid off in 2019, and we currently have $80,000 of program income that we can utilize towards this new uh, COVID-19 um, effort. The draft CARES Act guidance includes uh, for the city of Capitola, $93,664. Um, this was just draft guidance that was published, and as I said, the NOFA has not been published at this time. Um, at the time of writing the staff report, HC, I, I'd been talking with the HCD staff, and they recommended increasing the number to 114000 to provide us some um, cushion in our request. I called HCD again yesterday and just asked them more questions about, can we go higher? And they said, we can go higher. We can um, update it to have a not to exceed amount that's greater, and that would be a safeguard in case more funds became available and it wouldn't have to come back for a public hearing. So this evening, I'm going to be modifying my recommendation and requesting that um, we up, we, we change the language to go to up to 
$250,000. And I'll break this down further in a future slide, and I also have a recommendation to change the motion at the end, so in, all written out. The big takeaway here is that you can list a larger number in your resolution, it'll save us time, and right now, time's of the essence with all of this, so. Next slide. Um, so how can the funds be utilized? The activities, um, they can be utilized for activities that address immediate and medium-term responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Activities must be related to the preparation, prevention, response, and recovery of the COVID-19 pandemic. And CBDG has, um, although the exact guidance isn't out at this time for the, the um, documents that they have put out ahead of time, they're allowing up to three CDBG activities, and I'll get into that next. Um, so CBDG has four defined activities in which the, the money can be used for. First is public service. This includes food distribution and rental assistance programs. Um, second is public facilities. This includes conversions of public facilities to healthcare facilities. So luckily, uh, Capitola, we haven't been in this situation where we've had to convert any of our public facilities into a healthcare facility, so that one we would not apply for. Third is housing facilities for persons experiencing homelessness. This includes providing shelter to homeless in response to COVID-19. And uh, applicable for us, uh, every year we donate to HAP, the Homeless Action Partnership, regional partnership that we're involved in and that the money could be utilized for that. And fourth is economic development, so small business grants. This is um, a couple, ex one example I can give you of this is the city of Watsonville. They're um, a CBDG entitled community, which is different from us. We need to apply for the grants. Um, but so they, they have funding coming in and they set up a small business grant program in which applicants could apply for up to $2,000 to help with, uh, for small businesses to help with their rent or any utilities. So that, that was posted recently. The response to that was great. There's a great need out there. So um, in the resolution, we also must identify where the funds will be utilized of those four programs. And then there's also a 17% administration. I reached out to the Community Foundation to assess the needs of one activity over another. I heard that the need is great in all areas. Um, and they couldn't prioritize one over the other at this time. Also, I've reached out to CBDG entitled communities, such as Watsonville that I just gave an example of, and uh, Santa Cruz, um, who are both providing, provided with CBDG funding annually and do not have to go through the same application process as Capitola as a non-entitlement community. Um, they gave me direction that within uh, when they advertise for rental assistance and also economic development opportunities, again, the response was great and the need is there. So um, knowing this, it, it's hard to put one above the other. So I'm suggesting that the city divide the funds evenly between food, rental assistance, housing for the homeless, and economic development. Also, if one activity was to no longer have such a great need, so say if uh, an angel donor came in and gave a lot of money to our food um, banks and they weren't asking for as much money, we can work with the HCD and redefine our distribution and they'll work with us on that. Um, so what would this look like? On this slide I have a breakdown. Um, the second to last column I show the likely outcome to be tied to a total grant of $195,000 and that's what we're estimating that we'll get. Um, on the last column, I show the greater amount if we were to actually get more funding up to the 250, which would be a total of 330,000 and change. Um, the point to take away here is that the grade is need for all activities, so we have the ability to amend the allocations later, but in my recommendation, we divide food, food services, rental assistance, housing for the homeless and economic development equally. And then CBDG grants are administration heavy. There's a lot of documentation that has to go into distributing these funds and qualifying 
um, the grants as they're distributed. So there's a 17% administration that comes along with us and we would be putting out an RFP um, immediately to find a third party to help us administer this as it, I hear it is, it's very paperwork intensive and documentation intensive. Um, th my other recommendation tonight is there are a lot of decisions to be made upon this, that, such as creating the process for the grant application and how we distribute the funds and how they're awarded. Um, so this evening I am asking for an ad hoc committee to be formed. Um, this would consist of myself, the assistant to the city manager, and two city council members. Uh, next slide, please. So my recommended action tonight is to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to submit a community a CDBG CV application requesting up to, and we're going to change the amount to 250,000 of CDBG CV grant funds, reutilizing $80,632.35 of CBDG program income funds for a total of 330. 632 for three COVID-19 related relief programs and to execute the grant agreement upon award and then also to identify two council members to participate in the ad hoc subcommittee. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And the next slide, actually I'll bring this up. Oh. Well, at the end when it's time to make a motion, I do have a slide that outlines exactly what needs to be read into the record. Okay, so thank Great. you. All right, so questions. I'm, I've actually got a couple, so I'm going to start us off and then we'll get the ball rolling. When do we expect that we would get this funding? They're trying to distribute it as quickly as possible. So that, that is why they've told cities to um, go forward with your resolutions, not knowing exactly what the numbers are. But once the funding comes in, we really want to get this RFP out, be ready for it so we can um, turn it around really quick. That's the, the whole point behind this. Um, avenue through the CBDG grants is to get it out quick. Okay, uh, and just to clarify, because I, I know I'm going to get questions about it, the economic development part of this is small business grants, correct? Correct. So um, I have to say the guidance that's been out there is very, uh, it, it's not very clear at this point, but with everyone I have been talking to, it sounds like small business grants. Um, how we define that, I think we have some um, flexibility. Um, and with the, the food distribution, I know some of the programs that we funded through our community grant program offered food distribution. Would we need to choose one? Or could we divide this funding up, you know, amongst organizations that offer food distribution? Okay, that's a great question. So we could utilize multiple organizations, but we'd have to show that they're serving different populations. Okay. And could we also, I know um, rental assistance was one. Could we do the same with with yes, yeah, funding. as long as we can show that they're not serving the same population. Perfect. So, and there's, there's a tie back to, um, with CBDG grants to be supporting low-income families too, so that's... Perfect. Okay, and then my final question, if we could go back um, a slide or two, the one with the breakdown of the funding. So this one. So you mentioned dividing it up equally, but it looks like the top gets 41% and the next two down get 20. So that would be 20.75 for food and 20.75 for rent, rental assistance. They're just both, the activity is the public service oh, response, I so I had to put them together. because they're, they're, okay. they're under the same heading. Perfect, thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Okay, we're gonna uh, bring it to the council. Uh, any council members have questions? Council member Bertrand. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay. So uh, we do rental assistance now, and I think first month, and uh, you know, move-in fees and stuff like that. So we have standards. Would those fit in the standards that this grant would um, demand? Yes, they would. They're actually the rental assistance we do now is for low income, so it would fit. Okay. And then with HAP. Um, I suppose that fits in the standards too. It does. Um, I'm not sure if all, 
all of the costs associated with the Housing Action Partnership would be eligible, <clears throat> but the majority of the costs are associated with the winter shelter. There are some other minor costs associated with the um, biannual census that's done and um, some administrative support mm -hmm. that's provided. So we would have to research that. And, and we would just need documentation from them as well, showing that the need's gone up since the crisis. So. Okay, it's hard to understand some of the words, but um, so Katie, so I guess we must have a point person that we could um, tie in with to get some resolution when we try to make choices. Yes, you know, I've been doing a lot of, I've been reaching out to a lot of our partners in the community and getting, um, hearing what different entities have been doing with this money. And we'll, we'll definitely be, uh, it'll be a, a community effort in how this money is spent between multiple nonprofits. And um, hopefully our, I'm going to, with the RFP going out, find somebody to administer that has great experience with CBDG grants and can make this as smooth as possible for anyone that we provide a grant to. Okay, and one more question. You mentioned that there's um, significant uh, paperwork, and so in terms of the ad hoc committee um, working with staff and whoever answers the RFQ, how much work do you anticipate? For the ad hoc committee, I think there would be um, in the next two weeks, we sh we'd probably have a, f a couple meetings to make some decisions on how we're going to go about, um, we need to, to advertise that the money will be coming to us and be available and then um, and then how we're going to decide on s the selection process. So it would be um, it, in the next two weeks, I think we'd be spending, we probably have two meetings each week or one meeting a week for the next two weeks, but we would really need to jump into this right away. So you want to get it going real fast, I guess, so be intense up front? Yes. Thank you. All right. Let me pull up. Sorry, I'm trying to see all the participants. Okay. Um, any additional questions? I do have one minor clarification on the recommendation. Sure. So the ad hoc committee that we're recommending being formed would be comprised of two council members. Staff would be providing support. And so it would be a non-Brown Act um, committee. Okay. It's a sort of a minor technicality, but we're not suggesting that the committee would be consistent of all those members. It would just be the two council members with staff support. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any additional questions, so we will bring this to public comment. Have we received any public comment on this item? I don't see. I believe we I got one. one. Oh, yeah, was this one earlier? Right. Thank you. Let me put. I need to share the screen. Dear Council Members, the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, Incorporated CAB encourages your Council to support the resolution authorizing submission of a CDBGCB application for COVID-19 related relief programs. As you know, CAB is the county's designated community action agency, tasked with addressing poverty in our county through six programs. CAB's Rental Assistance Program has provided eviction prevention support to help low-income Capitola residents and other county residents avoid eviction and homelessness for several decades. Throughout the year, we hear from seniors, disabled individuals and families with children who struggle with rent due to circumstances such as unexpected medical expenses, family separations, and job loss in our high-cost community. We anticipate that with the upcoming ending of the eviction moratorium, we will hear from many Capitola residents in desperate need of rental assistance to avoid eviction due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on local jobs and the economy. Therefore, we support use of some of the CDBGCB funds toward rental assistance in Capitola in order to avoid an eviction and homelessness crisis on top of the current public health crisis. Prevention is critical because keeping families in their current housing is less disruptive and more cost-effective than trying to assist a family once they've become homeless and need to try to obtain other housing, especially in this current difficult environment. Sincerely, Paz Padilla, Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, 
Incorporated. Great, thank you. Do you have any additional public comment? Doesn't look like it. All right. Seeing none, I will bring it back to council for uh, comment and deliberation. Uh, I would like to, s let's see, we have the uh, resolution. I know Katie, you said you had a slide that you needed to pull up for like exactly what needs to be read into the record for when we're ready for that. Um, and before we get there, I know we need two council members to be a part of this. Um, I will certainly open it up to anyone who's interested. I would like to be a part of it and I would recommend that count uh, Vice Mayor Brooks uh, join me on that as well, but I am certainly, uh, of course, open to uh, all comments and recommendations. So uh, let's move forward with council comments. If anyone has a hand to raise, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, thank you, Mayor Peterson, for the suggestion um, and the recommendation. I would be more than happy to sit on the subcommittee with you. And then I saw Councilmember Bertrand, and then we'll go to Councilmember Botsworth. Okay. I was going to volunteer too, but uh, um, I'll go with you and uh, Vice Mayor. It's fine. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Do you have any uh, additional comments? No, that's it. Thank you, Councilmember Botsworth. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I'm in support of this, and I think that uh, yourself and the Vice Mayor make an excellent team there. To, to try to make the best effort to distribute this money to the, to the people that need it the most. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Botchworth. Councilmember Story, do you have any comments? No, no comments. Thank you. All right. Uh, if anyone has any additional comments, go ahead and, and uh, raise your hand or the hand emoji. Um, and then otherwise, we will uh, entertain a motion based on the uh, staff recommendation that is on the screen. Hold on, I that forgot is to, a detailed recommendation. I forgot to share the screen. <clears throat> Do we need this read into the record? Yes. That's my understanding. Okay. So whoever makes, whoever, if anyone chooses to uh, adopt staff's recommended motion, they need to read this whole thing. Is that correct? You, you know, That's what the city attorney had suggested. Maybe earlier. the city attorney could offer some options. <laughs> Sure. I, I, the best practice would be for someone to read the entire thing, or I could just read the amendment and someone could say adopt resolution with the change read by the city attorney. So why don't I just read the amendment? The amendment will state, the amendment to section one shall state the city council has reviewed and hereby approves the submission to the state of California of one or more applications in the aggregate amount not to exceed of $330,362 up to 250,000 of CDBG CV funds and up to $80,632.35 of CDBG program income funds for the following CDBG activities pursuant to the 2020 CDBG CV NOFAT for the following activities. General administration, $56,161. Public services to respond to COVID-19 impact, $137,100. Housing facilities for homeless, $68,550. Economic development, $68,550 for a total of $330,362. So the person who makes the motion should make the motion with the change that I just read into the record. Thank you. And I believe uh, Council Member Bautorf, yeah, had his hand up. I would like to make that motion with the change into the record. I would also like to nominate uh, Mayor Peterson and Vice Mayor Brooks to serve on the subcommittee to participate in the CDG CV ad hoc subcommittee. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right. Motion by Council Member Bautorf, second by Vice Mayor Brooks. Can we get uh, any additional comment before we go for a vote? All right. Uh, can we get a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand? Aye. Councilmember Botorf? Aye. Councilmember Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And I had my hand raised for an additional comment. Um, I just want to ask for the sub, uh, ad hoc committee um, if, when we come back to this, if we can see a side by side to get some information on which of our uh, current community grants fall in line 
with the activities um, as a comparison. Thank you. Pick up that. I got it. Okay, cool. Yep. Thanks. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, let's move on to uh, the last item on our agenda. Item 8E, Zoning Code Update, Chapter 17.44, Coastal Overlay Zone. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so before you this evening is the latest update to the Zoning Code certification uh, oh it was in the presentation yeah it just it's in that same one. sorry it was going to be really easy wasn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> i made it harder okay good evening before you tonight is the update on the zoning code next slide please um currently the zoning code is we adopted one the new zoning code in 2018 the new zoning code does not take effect within the coastal commission in the, within the coastal zone until it is adopted by the coastal commission so currently we're acting under the 1975 zoning code within the coastal area and um, this is tonight's presentation is an effort to get us closer towards that lcp adoption by coastal commission next slide um, following adoption of the zoning code in 2018, I provided a copy of the zoning code update to Coastal Commission staff. Due to the volume of the document, it take, took them time to review. We got comments back in November of 2018. Um, in early 2019, we had a couple meetings with Planning Commission. They, they forwarded the, their revisions to the City Council in March of 2019 with a positive recommendation for adoption. City Council reviewed this um, following that March meeting and um, next slide please as you will recall in our april may and june of last year we discussed the coastal commission revisions our previous city attorney created a list of requested edits that appeared not to align with the coastal act uh, the city council asked that staff go back and work with the coastal commission staff um, and we have gone through that process with the coastal commission staff and what i'm going to present to you tonight is the five page um, list of edits. We provided red lines um, that were delivered to each of you. And so you could see all of the full edits within the document, but I'm gonna just work off of that spreadsheet because I think it's the easiest to follow. So next slide, please. Okay, so tonight I'm gonna go through the, the overall spreadsheet and then following that, I am gonna briefly touch on the items that we're going to discuss at the next hearing, just to bring them, uh, bring them fresh into your minds. Um, and so from that next slide, before we discuss them at the next hearing. So before you is the first page of the spreadsheet. And I'm showing on the slide in this last column, the recommended changes. What we did when we worked with the Coastal Commission staff is any, any area in which we, we weren't sure why they were asking for the change. Um, we asked them to reference the section of the Coastal Act in which it applied to. And through going through that process with them, they would reference the section and then we would take the actual language from the Coastal Act because it was more in a, in a line um, of what their authority is. So it was a good exercise and now I think we have a much stronger coastal overlay zone. So under the first, I'm not going to go through all of these individually. I'm going to highlight a few of the top ones, and then we can go back and um, any questions anyone has. But under the first edit, this one was of concern because it said that the way in which to interpret this would be the, the utilizing the broadest interpretation possible. So we've modified the language to reflect what it says their um, review authority is within the Coastal Act. And there is one edit at the very last paragraph. It says, um, the social and economic needs of the people of the Capitola and the state. So we're gonna remove the word the, and that's what I have the blue circle around. Um, otherwise, we just have an update on values. And I'll move on to the, the and then the last section discusses um, discretion of the, the bodies that are reviewing an application. Um, 
but with more clear language than was originally proposed. So, um, and actually the third one down is pretty important too. The structure, they, they had removed our language for permanently attached to the ground, which would have meant any tent that went up in the village would have needed a coastal development permit anytime we put up anything temporary. So we were able to agree on putting our original definition back. So next slide, please. Under this slide, again, we, uh, it clarifies the Coastal Commission's authority with previously issued permits to reflect the language in the Coastal Act. And then the other two changes are, again, just creating consistency with the Coastal Act. Are there any questions on page two of the spreadsheet? I guess we'll get there. Oh, what's that? I, we can go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, In this next page, again, we're adding more consistency with the Coastal Act and making, there was some ambiguity in the review criteria under the second item down to um, who the review authority would be for repair, maintenance, and utility hookups that the community development director would make a decision there. Um, but otherwise, the, this page was mostly um, consistency with the Coastal Act, and then the fourth item down there, the Coastal Commission had requested that we list all the application requirements within the code. We typically do not do that as a practice. So um, in working with them, we've agreed. Um, actually, this one, we may it may come back <laughs> because this is the one point that they, they weren't in total agreement with, but they um, understood our point and we'll see if we get a red line when we submit this one to the Coastal Commission but otherwise it was for consistency and we were in agreement. Next slide please. Um, on the the top item this is important when there's a an emergency permit um, it just referenced the authority of the community development director typically whenever we have a um, an emergency it comes through public works so examples are a bluff top and the this past winter and having to initiate a, a coastal emergency and our wharf um, an emergency permit and then just again just clarifying language and um, also in on this page there were some references to if you didn't follow the procedures what the outcomes would be and we've we've modified the language to provide greater flexibility so that we can look at what the issue was if somebody didn't apply for their um, emergency permit and really um, find the, the correct the, the right correction for the issue next slide please um, and lastly, on this slide, there, this is bringing up the other two items that were out of the coastal overlay zone. And the second to last item has to do with minor and major um, encroachment permits. And these we see regularly at the Planning Commission. Um, and we added a reference to Chapter 12.56 here, that it's under the authority of either the Public Works Director or the Planning Commission. So we hadn't had that in the zoning code language before, so that's a new section that the coastal staff added and then we made it to really fit within our code. So the language is, um, has improved. And then lastly, um, coastal staff pr proposed some language um, in our parking section and it, we modified this to really build in options. There's one change I would like to make also within this section um, that we caught later, but ha I've circled it within the spreadsheet, but when parking is reduced, the city shall, and it says, require alternative opportunities, and it should be shall evaluate alternative opportunities. So that's the second modification I'd like to request this evening. But with that, um, I'm happy to answer any question that really highlights the modifications in this chapter. Thank but you. It, thanks. All right, any questions from council? Feel free to raise your hand. Seeing none, 
Let's see if we have any public comment. I don't see any. All right, seeing no public comment, the public comment for this item is closed and we will bring it back to council for uh, discussion and do you need a vote or just a rec just an okay for you know um, I was going to do a quick overview of what's coming next but okay. for now we could do the motion for this because the other is not um, sure. was not noticed was here okay okay so, so the motion so you do need to vote on this just to accept the staff just to accept the changes and yeah um, it should the recommendation should be yep to accept the changes and then to continue the item to the next meeting all right, a uh, discussion and a vote. Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, I just want to thank the staff and Kate for doing this work. It's much more clear and also it's obvious that you're working well with the Coastal Commission and we do have some hard issues coming up. So with that, I'd like to make a motion to accept the changes. And um, there was a second portion, uh, see what is it? And continue the public hearing on May the 28th. Uh, city council meeting. Thank you, council member Bertrand. Do we have a second? Council member. I'll second. Oh. Okay. Council uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, council member Baltorf, do you have additional comments? I know. I was just going to second, but uh, Vice Mayor Brooks got to it, so that's great. Okay. <laughs> Any additional council comments? All right, seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote and then we'll bring it back uh, to Katie for uh, next steps. Great. Council member Bertrand. Aye. Council member Botwerp. Aye. Council member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously, thank you. All right, next steps. Okay, so next steps. When we come back in two weeks, we're going to be talking about the Monarch Cove Inn. And just as a quick reminder, um, the new code that was adopted talks about the single, um, was, uh, so there was a new zoning map that was adopted that identified the Monarch Cove site as an R1 single family property. And then in there, the, the note that was attached to Monarch Cove was single family dwelling requires a conditional use permit and shall comply with the development standards of R1. So really allowing it to revert back to R1 as the property owner would like. Um, next, Jamie. Then the city, the uh, Coastal Commission staff redlined our submittal and said they'll allow the single family dwelling only if ancillary to a visitor's accommodating use. So when we talk about this next week, we're gonna be asking for direction on the Planning Commission recommendation. Jamie? And the Planning Commission uh, recommended single family dwellings allowed and instead of only if ancillary to, but in conjunction with visitor ser serving accommodation use or grant of public access to a viewpoint. So. Um, it's giving them an option of either doing visitor serving accommodations on the site or a grant of public access to a viewpoint. And it's shown in our L LCP as a viewpoint of one of the properties in Capitola with view. So that, that's a little summary on that and then I'll, get, I'll give you a highlight so the next item we'll be discussing. Next slide, please. Um, next is the Village Hotel. When we submitted this to Coastal Commission, they asked that they added um, language about the maximum height of the hotel and that it should include all rooftop um, architectural elements such as you know air conditioning units and then they also added a limit of at least 10 feet below the top elevation of the bluff and when the planning commission reviewed this they really wanted to build in more flexibility in the design and not have such a hard uh, a 10 foot limit. So, um, Jamie, next slide, please. So the Planning Commission recommendation was to remove the 10 foot height and then also revise the viewpoints for, uh, looking for the, from the hotel, from the village, to say from the southern parking lot along um, the, bl the Bluff of Cliff Drive because it's at a higher elevation before they were asking for a lower elevation that you probably wouldn't see the green edge above and also the Capitola Wharf. So we'll be discussing that at the next hearing. And then there's one more item. 
Um, next slide. This is about parking in the village, and I think you all may recall um, recently we've had a, a couple applications that went through planning commission where we have this part of our code that says you have to require parking if you make your um, residence any bigger within the capital village, but it needs to be within walking distance in a nearby lot and at your best friend's house. You know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense and our in-lieu program doesn't support what the language says in the code. And really digging into this and looking at our, land, our uh, local coastal plan, next slide, Jamie. It's really focused on not making more curb cuts and keeping our village pedestrian friendly. So we'll be bringing forward some language that we think achieves that goal. So, and that, that will be distributed to you. I'll get it out to you ahead of schedule so you have time to look at it but that's just a quick overview of what you're going to see at the next meeting so you can start thinking about those items thank you thank you all right now we've come to the end of tonight's agenda so uh, we're going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting thank you so much to all the council members thank you staff um, thank you to everyone who used our virtual public comment options tonight. That was one of the first times we've ever gotten actual virtual public comment, and it was fantastic. Thank you. Um, more than ever, please take care of yourselves. Please take care of each other, and the meeting is adjourned.